Welcome everybody to the fourth and final week of uh, the uh, paths to sustainability and uh, your private life, personal life, uh, or the climate personal action class. We're going to talk about renewables, uh, carbon removal a little bit, and case studies, and there'll be a lot of review of highlights of the first few weeks. So um, under renewables, we'll discuss uh, PV and solar hot water and potential hydro and wind and biochar um, from a couple of different standpoints. And then we'll talk about solar access laws, which can affect your ability to harvest the renewables that are available. And then case studies of Linda Hartman's house, uh, John Avenson's house and my house, and you'll see the types of things that were done. Uh, so uh, first, the assignment for this week was that you will review your uh, home for the kind of heating you have, cooling, domestic, um, uh, water, heating, and then the major appliances. So uh, first off, how many of you have a gas forced air furnace? Okay. Two of them. Two of them. Two of them. I, one wasn't enough, so we had to have two. Okay. Are, are you shooting for three? Huh? Are you shooting for three? Oh, wait. I, I'm sure we could find space for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and what vintage do you have? Is it back from the 70s, where they were about 65% efficient, or is it from the 90s, but still with the flew out the uh, attic where it's about 80% fission, or is it one of those newfangled with the plastic pipes going out to the side, a condensing furnace that actually brings in the combustion air, sends out the exhaust through plastic because they're 92 to 95, 96% efficient. Got one of each. One of each, one good and one bad. Okay, uh, what is yours, uh, Richard Fran? Um, our, our house was put together in 1956 and with the original uh, furnace. Okay, fact, so it's about the 60% efficient. Yeah. You can make major gains. Okay, Linda's is about an 80%. Um, the standards had improved. Hers is a 2001. And John used to have an inefficient one, but he's uh, yanked it out because he's getting his heat from the sun and he's thickened his walls dramatically and done all the things to retain heat. Okay, on cooling, uh, what do you, how many have air conditioning? And how many have evaporative cooling? Zero. John does? Okay, and uh, how many don't have any cooling? Okay, so three of you have no cooling. Do you have good shade? We, we just open our windows at night. And so you ventilate at night. Or retreat to the basement in August. <laughs> and retreat to the basement. And, and that yeah, can work. Because um, basements typically will stay in the low 60s, pretty much. Um, okay. Um, and then how many of you have a big hot tub out on your deck? No. Good. When I bought my house, it did. And I found a friend that wanted it, and we split the cost of moving it to his house. <laughs> because it was just electrically heating the grate out of doors. Uh, gas barbecue grills, none. Good, because that, um, I mean, you can use a sun oven. Uh, but you have refrigerators and maybe a freezer uh, for long-term storage. Okay, uh, refrigerators, are they uh, Energy Star? How old is your refrigerator, Fran? Uh, is it You, you, you can do, uh, you can get major energy improvements That's with right. the newer refrigerators. By five yes. times. <laughs> yeah. You're probably pulling four, I mean, 500 <coughs> watts, and you can pull less than 100 watts. Oh, wow. I understand there's uh, uh, freeze free uh, refrigerators have a heater inside to warm up and prevent the freezing happening. So the frost free ones. Yeah, the frost they have things, yeah. The problem. Okay, Phil? Well, uh, what generation of refrigerator? Oh, gee, it's 
probably 25 years old now. Okay, so you can find major benefit in, yeah. in a new one. Can I get an example? Yeah. My 1997 refrigerator, to hold 400 watts, my 2004 E-Star was 99 watts. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's pretty dramatic. Okay, um, now in reviewing your potential for uh, renewables, uh, what did any of you find? Did, did you consider your house looking? Uh, assignment at the end of the first week was uh, get the view from aerial view of your house, which gives you perspective on maybe what renewables you can do. And we'll talk through that with the aerial view in a minute. But did you come up with an idea of what you could do and what you Pl might? Plenty of roof space for uh, solar panels. Good. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a peak roof north-south. Your faces go east and west. Yeah, yeah. I'll just mention, good point. I'm, east and west will get 15% less than south. You're still getting 85%. We're in Colorado where there's lots of sun. So that's not bad. Okay. The east has the advantage because typically the panels are cooler and therefore higher productive. And so the west, they're hotter because of the time of day and less productive. And also the west. Quite often, storms come up in the afternoon, so the clouds. So even though east and west are equivalent in rough theory in Colorado, the east is the preferred. I think this cosine squared business about the angle versus the, the, uh, the, the uh, silver panel, but I'm curious about whether it's useful. It seems to be important to twist the solar panel to match more, more south. You can, but then you have to worry about wind. But, but then you have to worry about the first stage, second stage, and the shadow this throws on that, so it has to be spaced further. And by spacing it further, when you twisted it and yeah. ramped it up, you're not getting as much when you do that as if you just face them east or face them west. Sure. So, okay. Um, okay. Um, and we'll just look, okay, at this house, conveniently mine. Uh, you see it's got solar panels, solar panels, and then you've got passive solar for the food dehydrator and heater for the house, and passive solar for the clothes dryer and heater for the house. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, so there's sun catching capability. I could have a wind catcher here, but they never went commercial. There's a lovely one. Sits on a ridge, the wind comes in, spins, and it accelerates because of the roof rise. I saw that six years ago in media. In Europe, it's not, never gotten here. On wind, if I were to put a tower up here in a windmill, the city wouldn't let me because if you're on a city lot, when it falls down, it has to fall on your property. <laughs> you cannot risk people in the street or neighbors. Um, so, uh, now, I don't have a real good way of getting hydro because the flow down the gutter here isn't really good and to try to capture hydro out of that would be pointless. There is a ditch along the back, but it's got almost no flow, so hydro is not practical. So really, in our environment in Colorado, solar, both photovoltaic and passive, now, some people like to do solar hot water, and so that's another kind of panel you can put up here. And if you do, for just the domestic hot water, solar hot water is about an 80% efficient capture method. But in your use, you need a second tank and a third tank. You have to have backup, and you'll, it ends up less efficient end-to-end -end than photovoltaics. So if you're just putting more photovoltaics up and you run a heat pump water heater, you get a higher end-to-end -end efficiency than solar hot water. If it's a brand new house, solar hot water in big amounts to do in-floor heating with it can uh, pencil out. 
but in a retrofit, it's very hard to make it pencil out. Um, now, you also, whoops. Oh. Well, I wanted to highlight the garden gets the renewables because it gets you food. And I thought I had a slide with that circle, but I guess I didn't. So, um, so in the first week, I had Peter Drucker with, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve. You got to be able to see what you're doing. And, uh, uh, and then my own little words, after measuring, listen to what the number's telling you. Uh, I mean, you can measure it and not follow the cues it gives, but you should. So the metrics, and you did an exercise where you would do that in the first week of your assignment, look at your utility bills and do calculations and also get the screenshots so you can do your renewables and then study your ceilings for thickness. Now, I remember that most of you said in your attics you had about six or eight inches of insulation. John has much more, Linda has much more as retrofits. Six to eight inches of a blown insulation at about three or three per inches, about 18 to 25 loosely. Uh, so our value, uh, 18 to 25 loses a lot of heat in the uh, winter and gains a lot of heat in the summer. Um, so, um, so the ceilings is an area where you can do very well. Now we talked about visualizing and you can visualize from the standpoint of how energy is produced in either coal or nuke or wind or water or solar. And you can also visualize in the, your metering so you see what it is and in your bills. And the bills are what you can use to do your, your calculations. So um, you can also visualize with an infrared camera and you see where, where the, uh, from the outside you see the hot spots. That's where your heat's going out. And notice windows and doors are key and a little bit of foundation, uh, depending on how well you can get your foundation insulated. Um, and from the inside, here's an inner door and an outer door. By opening that, that inner door, you can see it keeps you a lot warmer and the, you're getting out to near the outside. And this is where it's 26 degrees outside. Um, so you can visualize your energy use or energy loss a lot of ways. Another way is if you have an energy monitoring system, this is one day a couple weeks ago uh, at my house and it's showing by solar PV gain. It's showing charging the electric car. So red is use, green is production. It gives a summary for the day and this was a day that I drove a lot of miles so that's a much wider charge time. But in that day, I used 42 kilowatt hours, mainly in charging the car. I used a little bit in normal you know, background stuff. Uh, I generated 44.1 on the 7K system that's being monitored, 7K photovoltaic system. And so I, I did have 1.4 extra, even though it was a heavy drive day. This gives the 30-day usage. So for the 30 days leading up to that day, I used 689 kilowatt hours for the house and the car and generated 934. So I had extra 245 kilowatt hours. So there's another visualization. There's lots of ways of visualizing your meters, your bills, uh, thinking about the source, uh, the infrared for heat transfer in and out and getting uh, a graph like this. Notice a cloud came over right there. That's what notches are. Um, now you can look at it on a week at a time. Uh, here's a three day, the shortest three days of the year when it's really cold out. And that day got so very little because it's pretty cloudy. Uh, the tops are not as high. The neighbor's tree on the side is carving out of that bell shape curve because it's delaying beginning sun on the panel. Similarly, that carve out 
is from the side neighbor's trees. The back neighbor's trees actually have brought the top down on those. Uh, so that will get to something called solar access, something that the Navajo, the Greeks, ancient, and the Romans were really good at. Thou shalt not shade thy neighbor's sun. That is uh, uh, not out of uh, the modern Bible. That's out of uh, ancient and folk. Should have been the 11 commandments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, and, and you also, we talked about the units, and we talked about how you convert to carbon, and you folks have done your conversions. Second week, we talked a lot about the walls above grade and below grade. Now, uh, how many of you actually have insulation on the outside of your basement walls? John. And on the inside of your basement walls? Linda and John. Um, and... Um, Outside of the basement wall is better than inside of the basement wall because then that basement wall is a great thermal mass. And that thermal mass will retain its ballast. It's just amazing ballast for you. So thinking, if, if, if you got the energy, you dig around <laughs> and you put in four inches of polyiso, that's about 128, for four foot down, and you're digging and you know, toss it aside and then putting it back. That will do amazing things for, for the whole house by doing the basement. Um, and uh, now, um, for the above grade walls, you can add, if it's a two by four wall with fiberglass, you can have a tube filled with cellulose compressing all that and it can change from an R9 to an R14 wall. Now, if you're trying to get to R60 walls, that may seem kind of pointless because you're going to have to thicken. But then you can also thicken to the outside or thicken to the inside. If you thicken to the inside, you can't do it where you have a bathtub or a kitchen sink or anything. So there's reasons to go one way or another. And uh, um, if you have a brick house, face brick on cinder block on plaster, so it's really all masonry, you have a very low R value for the house. And if you wrap that on the outside with a foam, and there's commercial people that do this and then stucco it, it no longer looks like a brick house. But boy, that massive uh, wall is thermal mass, and that stabilizes your temperatures beautifully. Um, and then on windows and doors, um, the uh, old aluminum uh, windows are very conductive, so your heat goes in and out very badly. Um, the wood, you have an issue with wood takes a lot more maintenance. If the wood is covered, like many uh, architectural quality uh, windows are, with a metal outer wrap but wood on the inside, it looks pretty and it is protected. Um, your, if you do fiberglass, that is really good for preserving the uh, uh, glass, double or triple layer or quad layer glass, because fiberglass with heat and cool expands and contracts the same as the glass, so you don't get distortions that then pop the seams, don't let moisture get in between your panes. So fiberglass, really for long life, now, some fiberglass windows, when they first came out, were not insulated very well. So you saw in an infrared picture a lot of heat gain or loss on the frame. The window may have been really good, but the frame was not so good on that. So the better ones now have very good insulation inside the uh, formed fiberglass. Um, now, the glass package, the IGU, insulated glazing unit, of two or three or four, and three is quite often three glasses. Four is glass, mylar, mylar glass, so it doesn't get so heavy. And you can have gases in here, which are dense, and they don't circulate as much to transfer heat from layer to layer. And krypton is the best of the gases. Uh, but anyway, um, and argon is good but the best ones have Krypton. Um, so, but there's statistics 
on fenestration. Fenestration means hole in your wall. Windows and doors are fenestration. It's a classy hole in your wall. And so there's fenestration labels like this. This is your good old uncoated double glazed window called thermal pane. And that was the great discovery in 1960 or 70 or something around there. A thermal pane window. And, but you get about an R2 without coatings. That's better than one piece of glass, R1. A single piece of glass is R1. Double is loosely R2. And so you see the U value of point or 0 0.47, you divide one by 0. Point, and that's the 2.2, and that's the R value. Um, this window gives a 0.66 for visual transmittance. So you're getting two thirds of the light in. And you won't even notice that that's less than the whole light. Um, this one has a 0.63 for the solar heat gain. Uh, solar heat gain was one thing that window salesmen always talked about in the, on the south facing or west facing. The sun's coming through and it fades out your carpets, it fades out your curtains, it fades out everything. So they can play around with the coatings to get less on this, uh, less maybe on that, uh, a much higher R value, so less on this. And an example of how far it's gone is uh, an Alpen that John has one of in his house. Um, and the U factor is 0 0.1, which says the R is 10. It's better than a two by four wall with a bat of fiberglass. The window's better than the wall. I mean, that's amazing. Solar heat gain on that is down low at 0.15, so it's not going to be bleaching stuff out. It's not, if you have this lovely west side of your house looking at the mountains, that will make it so you don't burn up when the sun is setting on a summer evening coming in from that west. You can still see the mountains. The visual is 0.3, so that's down, you, you get a little bit of slightly darkened, but if you have these big windows, you're still going to see the mountains and you're not going to be frying while you see them. So your overall uh, vision and understanding is good. Um, so uh, now there, we talked about analysis tools, thermometers. John has them all over his house. I got about 18 in my house. I have the little discs that cost $2 at Walmart just nailed up in every room all over John's. I uh, got better things than that. And he's got little leads going into his computer. And uh, so his computer will tell him about all kinds of things on stuff and make decisions to raise curtains and lower curtains. Now, smudge candles, blow, blower doors. You saw John's blower door, you'll see it again. And that's to quantify home leakiness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Smudge candles, when the blower door is sucking the air out of the house, and maintaining a 50 pascal difference in pressure in and out. Then you can go around with these all around windows and outlets, and you can see if the flicker blows. If the flicker blows, you got a leak, and you can, oh, it's like right there, okay. <clears throat> um, uh, infrared thermometers, the little spot gun, uh, and cameras to get the big picture, amp meters, to see like John did on his refrigerator, the old refrigerator versus the new refrigerator, draw four amps or, uh, 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 or you were saying uh, uh, watts, uh, 400 watts or 99 watts. So it'll tell you, you just plug the planks and it, it into the wall. Um, and then radiation flow meters to test out old windows. And uh, so here's the blower door. This is the person doing the test. Here's John. The, there's a little window so you can see if somebody's coming on the other side. You know, uh, there's instrumentation. Here is the blower that fits in this hole. And by sitting there, it is set to blow out to create a pressure difference inside to outside. And when it does that, he, it, it measures the volume of air going out. So at a fixed pressure, a certain volume, is you can compute then the equivalent amount of holes all over around this and that to an area of one big hole and how much 
your house is leaking. And some houses have that big a hole in them if you take all the little cracks and holes. Um, so that sits in, he's setting it up right now. Uh, then this was the uh, itsy bitsy on your cell phone infrared camera. That's the one pixel, get a temperature with a laser gun. That's the bigger FLIR screen. This is where you plug your refrigerator in and it goes into the wall. And then this is for testing existing glass. Okay, and that's how little the thing in that case was that goes into your cell phone. It's not giving you as sharp a picture as this, but it gives you the sense. Okay, now we talked a little bit of tiers of energy upgrade actions, what you can do. And I think initially I didn't have tier zero. Get an energy audit, that's tier zero. <laughs> okay, uh, tier one, easy, contractable, standard action. Attic ceiling and insulating. And anybody that's doing attic insulating will offer sealing all those little cracks around. Um, LED light bulbs. You can screw out the old incandescent or CFL. Screw in an LED. It doesn't take too many rocket scientists to change a light bulb. <laughs> um, sun tunnels for daylighting. Um, and then a lighter roof color. Now, if you're in an HOA, you have no control of the roof color if it's uh, they, in many cases. Um, upgrade furnace and or water heater and maybe as far as a heat pump. Storm doors help, or a bigger version. Um, uh, new uh, windows, if you upgrade to the really good ones. If you have single thickness, if you've got an R1 window, even though you stretch your mylar over, then you're only an R2, but uh, upgrading windows. Um, more aggressive, wrap the walls and foam outside and put stucco over, or put a different finish on whatever you like. Uh, and then convert your heating to a earth-based um, uh, mini-split heat pump. This is called ge uh, geothermal, but it's not what was originally geothermal. Originally geothermal was hot springs and pulling that out and generating electricity. And that's where the name, the people selling the ground source heat pump take that name and they run with it and have commercialized it. So there's like anything that's bubbly and stings in your mouth is called Coke, even though it's Pepsi or yeah, diet yeah. soda, okay? I, I personally don't drink any of those. Um, and then um, convert to air-based mini-split heat pump, and you'll see an example of that. The most aggressive is add extra rooms around that act as buffers or vestibules or airlocks. Um, now, thinking Renewables versus extraction. So here we have, they're trying to look down for energy. And it's, look up, and they're, they're sweating, and they're rubbing the sweat off their brow while they're looking for what they can get out of the ground. Okay, well, okay. So renewables. Um, and sun in lots of ways, wind, water, Earth heat for deep hot rocks, that's the original geo. Earth heat for a heat pump and air heat for a heat pump. So I, I talked a little bit, but you can put a windmill, but not if it's gonna fall. You can uh, do lots of things to the roof and catch things. So um, on the heat pumps, well, here's where uh, the grow food. Now, when you're growing the food, you can enhance your productivity at the same time that you sequester former carbon that was in the carbon cycle. Because the carbon cycle gets pulled into leaves of trees and corn stalks and this and that. And that carbon is, if you pyrolyze the uh, biological stuff, you can put it in to your ground and to your soil. And here you see, and this is a homemade pyrolyzer I made. Um, the fire department shut me down. I didn't have a permit. If I would have, if I would have a, a hot dog uh, a stick and a hot dog on it and held it over the flames that were only four inches above, 
it would have been legal. It would have been a barbecue. Uh, but but uh, I didn't do that. So out came the fire engine and the chief and everything. Because a neighbor that doesn't approve of anything I'm doing in my house called him. But, you know, anyway. Um, uh, and you can get charcoal in a bag that you would normally use for cooking. But make sure it has no additives, no additives, no additives, no additives, no additives. Uh, now, here's four sample plots. Soil, soil and biochar. Soil and um, NPK, nitrogen, uh, potassium, potash, and biochar, and those. So the biochar, even with no fertilizer, is better than the fertilizer, and this is both. And you're putting that charcoal, which is stuff that had been in a carbon cycle, into the ground, and it'll stay there for a thousand years. And while it's there, it will provide host uh, residence to good micro microbes that move in. The charcoal basically is the cellular structure with all the VOCs out. So you just have all these uh, miniature condos and, mm -hmm. and all these good micros move into the miniature condos. And in there, you know, some are nocturnal, some are daytime workers. And, but every morning or every when they go off to their shift, they have their bamboo stick and their little red kerchief with their, their uh, mid-work uh, shift uh, uh, meal on the back and they whistle while they work. Um, okay. Anyway. Do the uh, earthworms like biochar? I, I have amazing amounts of earthworms. I don't know if it relates to that. Okay. So with alpaca poo, I, I, the, the, the champagne of poo <laughs> is alpaca because it doesn't smell. You can use it fresh, even on a garden you're working in. It looks like little deer pellets, and, um, and it's readily available free from all these ladies that have alpacas in the backyard that are getting the, the uh, fibers from the alpaca, which is a very good uh, uh, knitting fiber. So anyway, that's July um, and September. Um, uh, you, can, you can get good crops with alpaca, the champagne of poo and with uh, biochar. I put into my plot over three cubic yards of biochar. Um, okay, now case study, Linda's house. And Linda had to run out early today, uh, but it's an amazing story. She's in an HOA, which means she's not allowed to change anything that you can see outside. She's not allowed, I mean, it, it's a matter of you start to do something, you get a big slap on your hand. Even, so, even a garden in the backyard? No, no, no. She doesn't own the backyard. Oh. This is, this is a yeah, totally, she gets a foot and a half from her uh, wall. Annual carbon footprint for home and car in 2013 was 15.4 tons. This is a two bedroom. In 2015, she was down to eight tons. In 2016, 17, leading up to the solar home tour, she was down to one ton. And adding food into it the last 12 months, she's one and two thirds tons. She's nearly net zero where you can't do anything without getting questioned and slapped. Uh, now, the Nature Conservancy uh, calculation. I don't uh, understand that one and two thirds number. What, what's that mean? That's tons of carbon. Yeah, uh, yeah. so what food? No, that's. So. Uh, oh, that is. That is home, car, and food. Yes. These calculations didn't have her food. So what do you, how do you calculate the food? That's my question. Uh, in week one, you had that chart. It said if you eat this diet, this diet, or this diet, here is your carbon footprint. Uh -huh. That's pulled out of that. Oh, OK, I have to review it. Then. We'd have to go back to week yeah. one. Yeah. But it, it had, in week one, we had that. Yeah. So, but Nature Conservancy, when she did that online, it said 24 tons. Because they're getting all society stuff thrown in on top of you. Okay. She added R60 cellulose in the attic and had best way 
uh, insulation, seal all of the seams of the attic to reduce the convection up through because you do get a chimneying. If there's any way for the warmth to go out from inside of internal walls or external, uh, it will. She did all LED bulb conversion. She did the rim joists in the basement. You saw a picture a couple weeks ago of all around the edge of the basement wall between the floor joist, the rim joist, which is the outer, where there was a fiberglass bat just kind of loosely stuffed in that was porous as can be. She's got two three and a half inch pieces of polyiso foamed around, cut to fit all the way around. And so she gets no air leaks and she gets far less insects coming in. Um, and then five sun tunnels. Um, water heater was upgraded. She didn't go to a heat pump water heater. She stayed with natural gas. That would have been a bigger project. But she upgraded to one with the uh, electronic ignition. So she was not uh, having a uh, flame running all the time for pilot light. Uh, she upgraded when her old air conditioner uh, kicked the bucket. She upgraded to SEER 16, which for a house size air conditioner uh, was good. It doesn't have to run nearly as much because she got better attic insulation, much better attic. So it runs on a much lower duty cycle. She uh, changed the car to a Chevy Volt, and the Chevy Volt is powered by the new PV panels, 4400 watt PV system. She had Buglet and Golden put LG panels on, Lucky Gold Star, Life is Good panels, mm -hmm. which are a very good uh, panel. Um, her builder's aluminum windows, framed windows that were double glazed, uh, she replaced with Champion uh, vinyl windows. Now, at that point when she did that, she didn't know about Alpen windows, and she didn't know about the difference between a fiberglass and a vinyl, and the possibility to do a three or a four ply, which Alpen provides. Um, and the walls to the adjacent unit, because it's a duplex, it's a high class duplex. They don't call them duplexes anymore, but that's what it is. Um, she had noisy neighbors. <laughs> and mainly, mainly they're a lot older and they're just clunking around and slamming doors on things. Um, and then she also made more use out of the one, the second bedroom, to be an office and a bedroom by putting in a Murphy bed. So it stores. Um, and uh, so this is her unit. That's the neighbor unit. This is a wall that she thickened and that wall she thickened. And uh, uh, her front is there. That's her deck. Um, and then that R60 ad. Nominally, the builder had done R38. Anybody that looked at it said that was not R38, but nominally the builder did R38. And there was the little, uh, in the garage, the notice of what insulation is in there uh, said it was R38. It was not. Um, so anyway, uh, so looking at the tiers, the red things are the things that she's basically done. She can't do the roof because it's an HOA who owns the roof. Um, and uh, she didn't do storm windows or doors because she has a quality windows and storm windows or doors don't fit. She does have a storm door in the front that's always been there. Um, now, she's not wrapping the outside walls. HOA wouldn't allow that. Um, and she can't drill down 300 feet to do a geo. Um, uh, a mini split, and she can't drill down 5,000 feet to get to hot rock, okay? Um, but she could do, if she got the HOA and the city of Arvada's approval, a vestibule on the front, which is the north side. And so this is her north side. And so it's got between the garage and the north bedroom, there's this walk, and then right there, if she matched that door, if she matched that door and brought it out to there, she would have a six foot by six foot nice airlock vestibule on the north, which would warm up her unit a lot. So, but it wouldn't look like everybody else's unit. 
But it wouldn't look much different if she exactly matched that out there. When I enclosed my front little covered area from there to there, minus five by five, hers would be six by six, far more gracious than mine. So um, anyway, now he went ahead and went to John. So this is John's house, and he's done his walls dramatically. His house started out with all of the passive solar that NREL, when it was called SERI, the Solar Energy Research Institute, put. So it has amazing solar gain. Um, and, uh, uh, and he has had Best Way do an amazing blow of uh, cellulose into the area where the roof is a standard truss and he has height. On this side of the house, John's is a vaulted roof and he's just got two by 12s but he did have them um, tube fill as much as possible, but you're limited. A two by 12 is 10 and a half. So he's got a 10 and a half height. So it's compressed, but he's, he's feeling limited, right, John? Yeah. Oh, he's, he's rrr, I can't do anything more on that unless I take the whole roof off and put an extra layer like he did on his walls. Um, and so here is all the lovely passive solar. He's upgraded all of those windows to the Alpen 925 series, the high quality stuff. Um, now, this was designed to not catch heat in the summer, because you don't want to, but, um, for the most part, but in fact, it, um, uh, Needs at this time of year when you get a cold day because you're near to longest day, but you still have the winter hangover. Um, so he added these solar panels and more down there to give him more heat. And this is what they look like solar sheets, and they have a PV, you can get them with a this is a PV generator that runs the fan that pulls the air through them. John, you get up to 175 degree air coming in. Mm -hmm. And so on the west side, here's two of the four. There's another two over here. So that pulls in. And now, it's amazing. You're going to see his statistics. Boom, that's part of his display. <laughs> and here is his inside temperature. At 12 noon, he hasn't had, well, it's been dropping still from the day before. And at 12 noon, those... Because the, the clouds are over Colorado now. Yeah. It's just that the sun is not catching the sun. So, so he's climbing from that west face. And then once the sun's gone, he gets the normal cool down after that. So he... His whole thing, there's actually another whole column out there of stuff that isn't shown. He, he's got, uh, and it'll talk, it'll talk, if you ask it a uh, question, it'll talk back to you, politely. <laughs> uh, he can program it to be non-polite if he wants, I would assume. <laughs> can you? Anyway. Uh, so, he upgraded the massive south windows to about our 10. Uh, super insulated the walls to between our 50 and our 60 loosely. Um, uh, sealed and insulated parts of the attic to R100 approximately, right? Uh, and the rest to R38 because he's limited in that vaulted area. Um, added PV on the 4,700 watts and he did it right early on when it first became possible in Colorado. And the panels that he got are a company that's not around anymore. And they have degraded and he's had uh, Enroll out and they've tested on one and he got a partial settlement from uh, the current owner of that company, but it's, he's, he's really losing on that. So part of a case study is what happens over time, and that's kind of a negative side. In my case, I've lost. I had two systems, a 7K and a 3K, and I've lost on the 3K. The 7K is still performing fine. Uh, so there is what company matters. Um, he's got the solar sheets, Four on the west, and then three down along the bottom of the south. Um, and 
computer can, uh, controlled shading inside with mylar screens and outside on the south to keep stuff out. And then when, he, when it gets really hot, he covers up, up his west facing solar sheets. Um, all lights are LED. He moved the gas furnace and the gas water heater. Furnace he doesn't need. He's getting enough from the sun. He has a temporary replacement of the water heater with an electric, and he's going to go to a heat pump on that. That's just further down the process. So right now, he's got an inefficient interim in there. Um, and then he's automated the house with voice uh, controls, commands, and the house talks politely to him. And uh, what is the name of the house, the computer? Uh, was Rex, it's Alexa now. Alexa. Oh, you changed it. Because before that it was computer, and then it was Rex, and now it's Alexa. Okay, so so he, he's on his third wife. <laughs> when you say remove gas line, do they have to dig a hole and pull the pipes out? No, they shut it off. Oh, they put a lock on the pipe. They put a lock. They shut it and put a lock. Now, when Jim Smith did this to his office, they actually pulled the meter. It went away and it's just capped. Okay, so anyway, that's... John is working very hard to get this to be down to the point where the almost impossible point of getting passive house official recognition on a house that's old because the amount of air leak that you can have gets down to nil. And we wish him very good luck. And this guy will be back again very soon uh, to do a test. Okay, here's mine, what I've done on the walls in and out, and whoops. It always wants to jump to the, and then I did the top. And I basically filled in the top up to the gables. So if it was there, and then there, and then there, it's now all the way up. The ceilings didn't fall down, folks. <laughs> the ceilings didn't fall down. So um, the energy uh, for electricity, for gas, um, the fun thing to see is when I put in CFL bulbs, um, my natural gas usage went up because <laughs> I was not heating the house with incandescent bulbs. <laughs> I had been heating in the winter with incandescent bulbs, not as an intended thing. Uh, and then I put new windows in, and I got it just back to, and I put it in triple glazed. And all it did was undo that. <laughs> and that was $18,000 worth of triple glazed windows. I didn't at that point, this is back in 2002, three. I didn't go to a quad, I didn't go to the Mylar, to the Alpines, but these were considered to be about the best thing that I knew of at that time. I did a little bit of insulation, a little bit of insulation. I added a sunroom um, and, oh, the new furnace, oh, the new furnace. Here was the windows, there's the new furnace. And I had the 60 or 65% furnace. And so the new furnace for 3,200 bucks, which was 95.5% efficient, upgrade from the 60 to 65%, that new furnace for 3,200 bucks did more than $18,000 of the windows. <laughs> wow, wow, I'm still burning gas but a lot less, okay? And then more insulation, um, more insulation, a passive solar sunroom, more insulation, and then the next passive solar sunroom. For the electricity, you see, the electricity really dropped down with the ZFL bulbs. So that's, the gas went up, the other went down. Um, and then PV, more PV and more PV. As I said in another talk, I liked it, it tastes good. <laughs> Got some more. Um, best to go as much as you can in one integrated system. Um, okay, sun tunnels also, big ones. The bigger, a 10 inch, if it gets in one unit of light, 14 inch 
gets you almost two units of light because the square root of two is 1.414. And a 22 inch gets you about five times the light of a 10 inch. So five times light on one hole in the roof. So, um, <clears throat> and then I, I, I converted to LED uh, bulbs over time. But then plug-in cars started to take away my overproduction and the greenhouse and warming it up a little bit so that the banana trees wouldn't freeze. Because you don't want your banana trees freezing. Okay, now the mini split is replacing the furnace. This is the outside. The mini split does, uh, and it's a, this is size, the furnace, the original gas furnace was 135,000 uh, BTU furnace. My replacement furnace, because I had done a lot of improvements when I got the replacement furnace, it was only an 80,000 BTU. But now I'm only doing 25 therms a year. So I don't need an 80,000 BTU capability because the walls are thicker and everything. So a 12,000 BTU cooling because this is going to cool in the summer and heat in the winter. And a 16,000 BTU heating. And that I expect will meet my needs. I'm not ripping out the other yet, but I'm going to run this for a year. So that's the outside unit. On the east side, because that's where the sun comes up, so you get your heating when you want it. In the mornings when you want to start to build up, so it's going to heat. And it's on the east side so that when it's acting as the air conditioner, it's in the shade, because you want the cooling in the evening. If you put it on the west, it both doesn't get you the heat when you want it, and it doesn't do the cooling at the level that you want it to do in the winter. So placement is very important. If you put it right on top of the roof, it's in the heat all day, and so it can't cool nearly as well. Um, this is the inside unit. And you've seen these in a lot of places, and you just didn't know what you're seeing. And this has uh, SEER rating, cooling efficiency, compared to uh, a, a regular air conditioner, is 29.3. The range is 14 to 30, and it's 29.3. So it's right up there. Um, the <coughs> heating efficiency, because it's replacing furnace and evaporative cooler. Okay, it is a 13.8, and it's uh, 8.2 to 13.5. This is better than the best that the uh, people know exists. Okay, so before I did anything, 2002, I had a 29 ton. Now, I put in the um, PV panels, and that gave me a, a big credit because I was shipping stuff back to the grid. So I got down by 2008, right around that zero, at 0 0.5 tons from 29. I'd done a lot of wall, I'd done a lot of stuff. 2011, um, first solar edition, but I'm starting to uh, charge a car. But I got to minus, so I was carbon negative, minus four and a quarter tons. That was still while I had 10K of working PV. Now I only have 7K of working PV. The other three will be back. But I had a hailstorm and my roof, it's, it's waiting to come off and go back on and all of that stuff. So I'm back up to three tons. So I'm not carbon negative this last year. This shows that it's like um, anything, nothing is a static value. It changes over time depending on conditions. So you do things and you get improvements and a little bit of mother may I one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward. And so you get uh, things to happen. Um, but I'm, I'm doing uh, a lot more miles on the car, and it's a bigger EV, and uh, uh, so there's many different things that are happening. Now, just a little bit of summary, going back to the, the uh, ethical motivations. Uh, Martin Luther King said, somewhere we must make it clear that uh, we are concerned about the survival of the world, the survival of the environment. 
And I like to say there's no greater civil right than the right to a livable planet. It covers all people, all animals. It covers everybody. Now, Ann Richards, she's a neat lady. She was governor of Texas before Bush. Uh, you have to find the courage to talk to people you do not know. Tell them things they don't want to hear. And her daughter is the lady that for the last several years has been running the um, uh, Planned Parenthood. Right. And her, her daughter is, is great also. Um, and this is called advocacy. And you need to advocate. This is Master of Ad Advocacy, Bill McKibben. Um, in addition to the advocacy, we've got to do it in our own lives. We need to get it so everybody does. So we need a culture, a culture of personal action on climate. So we need to advocate to get the big structural things inside it, but we also have to get people to value doing things in their own life that get them to carbon negative. And um, uh, Mr. Satoro said, individually, we are only one drop, only one drop. But together, we are an ocean. That only happens if we get to the culture. And then out of the civil rights movement, you either have to be part of the solution or you're part of the problem. So getting to be part of the solution. Nelson Mandela, you can never have an impact on society if you have not changed yourself. You go around preaching all day and if you haven't done anything, you know, who wants to listen to you? Example is not the main thing, it's the only thing. You have to set an example. Whoops, it jumped up. And I love this one. Do what needs to be done? Check if it's impossible after you're done. Now, work for good and great, but not for perfection, because perfection is the enemy of good. You'll get frozen up. If you think you've got to be perfect, you won't do anything. And there is beauty in handcrafted stuff, in some little bits of imperfection. And this was our uh, Reverend Eric Banner uh, did this in chalice lighting for an old folks thing here at the church. I hope that in the year to come you make mistakes because if you make mistakes, then you are making new things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself, changing your world. You're doing things you've never done before and more importantly, you're doing something. So make new mistakes. Make glorious, amazing mistakes. Make mistakes nobody's ever made before. Don't freeze, don't stop. Don't worry that it isn't good enough or it isn't perfect. Whatever it is, art or love or work or family or life, whatever it is you're scared of doing, do it. I think that makes yeah. a statement. Yeah. And George Bernard Shaw, people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing <laughs> So I am just real quickly, a little bit of economics. People like to ask me when I gave this talk the last several years, what is your ROI? Return on investment. Return on investment. What are, so, you know, and I said, did you ever smoke or drink? And what was your ROI on that? <laughs> oh, well, that doesn't matter. Oh. What you want to do that's not necessarily good doesn't need an ROI, but what I want to do that's good requires an ROI. Wow, this is not investment. Is your smoking and drinking and gambling an investment? So anyway, um, in a world where CEOs are in blind pursuit of profits at all costs, we have Elon who does things to ensure human species survives instead of finding the greatest ROI. He may get a good ROI in the end, but if you read the financial pages, everybody's saying he's not gonna. That's all the classical economics books. So anyway, I will not know my ROI until the house is sold, and I will not be sold until I'm dead. So forget about ROI, you know. But just so you know, to add 13 rooms that surround the house, 1,300 square feet of passive additions, 
is about 47,500 or $36 a square foot. Now, they aren't heated, but they heat the house. <laughs> um, uh, other costs, insulation, lots of different insulation jobs over time. The sun tunnels, 2200 Heat pump, water heater, 1800 They're cheaper now. I got it 10 years ago uh, when they were new. Um, an energy recovery ventilator, uh, 4000 um, The 95% furnace, which now I'll end up taking out, was 3200 The mini split, 3500 installed. It's now in there. And uh, PV with battery backup uh, at those old prices that were higher. So I'm not talking about that because you'll get it much cheaper now because PV has come way down. So, total about $69,000, or, or 17, about 4,000 a year, 4,000 a year. Wow, and I got comfort, and I'm at around that zero, some years a little better, some years a little bit worse, 13 multifunctional rooms, uh, comfort, um, save transport fuel, I'm not paying for gas, uh, save home fuel, not paying for electricity, or, or ga natural gas, save major food expense because I'm growing a lot of stuff um, and doing my duty to my grandkids and uh, so uh, and, and to the country and to nature to use what the sun god I mean the pluralistic god in everything idea sun god uh, provides so alternative allocations four thousand dollars a year I could have had two packs of cigarettes a day <laughs> Or I could have had one cocktail in a, a reasonably good bar in L.A. I didn't check out. I checked on the web. <laughs> or I could have gotten a three for. I could have gotten two Starbucks Grand Lattes a day and a seven-day Veil lift ticket and a either cheap or medium tour uh, pack to go to Vegas. So I could have done that, that, or that, or done what I did to the house. What's the ROI on two packs of cigarettes a day? What's the ROI on one cocktail a day? What's the ROI on gambling and drinking Starbucks? <laughs> so since I didn't do all of those, what's left over? I only used one of those. So the, let's say I used the tobacco. So actually, the three for... And the drink bought me that, okay? And had a little bit of money left over. So, boy, I'm glad I didn't smoke, drink, and uh, go out to Vegas. So, ethics do not require economic justification. But I do get a better ROI, return on investment, from a negative carbon score than a low golf handicap or a coffee buzz, or a high bowling average, or a big beer belly. I mean, I got a big enough belly just eating good. Or smoker's lungs, or driving while intoxicated tickets, and lawyer fees, or drug addiction, or a gambling habit. And so there's the kind of rooms and uh, that are on the house, and they're all, Officially enclosed porches because they're not conditioned. They are not finished living spaces. Some of them feel pretty living. <laughs> um, and so they are conditioning, not conditioned. They heat the house when the sun shines. They buffer the house when the sun doesn't shine. And as unconditioned spaces, they have a lower tax assessment because they're not, they're enclosed porches. Okay? Most act as airlocks, so you don't have drafts. And some are airlocks on airlocks. So solar access, the critical elephant in the room. Thou shalt not shade thy neighbor's access to the sun, God's, and I put an extra sun goods, uh, energy gift. Ancient Greece, ancient Rome, Navajo America, all had these rules. So. Here's my house, neighbor's house without PV, neighbor with, neighbor with. This right here is a blue spruce that keeps getting higher and higher, and 
in the morning it's shading these and then it's shading those and the winter it starts out shading those. This whole row of trees back here is already taking out a lot of my passive solar in the deep winter in the December, January, February and it's a row of blue spruce all the way across and then a, a silver uh, maple that are up really high. I had an agreement that I could always trim them back to a certain level and I did one trimming they decided I couldn't retrim, and I last trimmed 12 years ago. So now they've shot up 20 feet, and so that's taking that. So the solar, solar access agreement that I had with them, I paid them $1, another valuable consideration, and they decided they really wanted to have all that big woods back there. But um, now, case study Trump. <laughs> what he says and what he does. Climate change is a Chinese conspiracy. It's not true. but. He's building seawalls around his Irish thing because of the protect from global warming and its effects. So anyway, <laughs> anyway. Um, so educate yourselves, educate yourselves on energy lifestyle and commit to right choices. And for those of you that have an interest, join the Colorado Renewable Energy Society and come to the meetings. Okay, we already covered that more than enough. And think out of the box. Okay. Questions? Uh, when you seal your house to almost zero any uh, external air, cold air, hot air, whatever, um, you wind up with, uh, I would say, stuff that is being emitted by the paint and the yeah, that's why you have the ERV. We talked about the energy recovery ventilator. And it's bringing in outside air, mm -hmm. taking out inside air. And just like Kim Jong-un and President Moon of South Korea, they shake hands as they pass in this ERV. Mm -hmm. And so the heat that was in the house air going out is transferred in that handshake to the air that's coming in at about a 95% exchange rate. And the humidity with an ERV, not the humidity if you get an HRV, heat recovery ventilator, energy recovery ventilator. So, and you can change the volume of airflow, and so you have really good fresh air. And if you have a meter sitting in your house, plugged in all the time, that tells you your CO2 level on a little screen, like I have and John has, it says, you know, that you're 480 or 520 parts per million of CO2. And if you also have a particulate meter in there, it'll tell you all of your particulates from uh, less than one micron to 2.5 to 10 microns. And uh, you'll know what your air quality is. Sounds like be a good investment for the first thing to do as you start sealing up your house to make sure the air in there is, is uh, freshened yeah. as you go. Oh, and ERV is what's really going to have to be an all new construction and all rehabbed uh, old construction. Any other questions? Yeah? That $36 a square foot that cost you to do your passive solar room. I, I, I'm, I'm the main laborer. Uh -huh. And I got all the materials <laughs> coal I scavenged. Okay. So, no, that's not a real retail price. Okay. But if you decide that this is a fun game, as fun as chasing a little white ball around a golf course, <laughs> I mean, and I think it's more fun. And women, gross sexist generalization, women are more eager to find the bargain shoppers than men. Okay, so um, I, I actually am a woman at heart. I like to find the bargain. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. In terms of the roof and, and the ceilings and stuff, we have an attic fan that was in the house when we bought it. Do we keep that or close it up? An attic fan does real well if you want to evacuate the heat at the end of the day. Open your windows and bring stuff in. I, I'm not going to give anybody an answer to a should I. You will figure out your path. I'm trying to give you information about what can be done, what has been done. But a lot of people, I think an attic fan works very well for. 
until you're super insulated. Once you're super insulated, but some people still want to do that quick exchange. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge. Well, yeah, I mean that's the basis of my question. Given that we're going to put all kinds of whatever we can squeeze into the attic space. You you, you learn from living with your house as it evolves. It's like you have a baby, and you have no idea when they're a teen what you need to do. But as you raise them, when they get to be a teen, you pretty much see what you need to do in guiding them at that point. It, it's it's an evolution, the average. How much luck have you had with, uh, let's say, influencing your nearby neighbors? Seems like some of them put TVs on their roof. Oh yeah, there, there's a lot of neighbors that, and my neighborhood has um, basically 52 houses built in the subdivision that I did, and I'm right on the border to the older subdivision from 1960, but I'm in the 78 and newer subdivision. And out of the 52, 20 of them originally were built passive solar because I'm only half a mile from Enro. And NREL gave lessons to the builders that bought those lots. Mm. And so mine was not done, but 20 of the 52, or almost 40%, did have passive solar. And they had only slightly upgraded uh, walls and things. That was not done that well. Uh, but, but there are people that are doing stuff in the neighborhood. And, and most of them, on everything I've done, go by, love it, love it. I mean, they, they, really like it. We've recently had issues with the insurance companies for house insurance and I'm wondering whether you've had issues with that as in okay you can't we can't afford to insure the fact you've got all these extra things that you did to your house. Uh, <laughs> um, you know the insurance I have a major claim because of the hailstorm and they have not said anything. It's you insure to the right level to cover the potential damage. How about building codes? Are they still back in the dark ages? Some are, some aren't. They're getting better. I get a permit on all of this. They, they know me real well, first name. I know them real well, first name. When I first went in with the drawings for this edition, right there, not for this up here, um, but I had my uh, graph paper with pencil lines, and straight edge pencil, took them in and they're, mm -hmm. they're expecting CAD CAM, lovely blue. And uh, as a homeowner, I can do things as long as I meet codes. And I spec'd out what the spans were and everything. I spec'd out the size of the boards for the stresses. I'd been on the web and I found out that, you know, um, hemp pine two by six will span so far if it's on 12 inch center or 16 inch center or 24 inch center. Whereas redwood will span a little less. I'm mainly using redwood and everything because I'm getting coal redwood, which is mighty fine wood for 75% off. It's the stuff that wasn't dead straight to be a deck. So something to class coal on redwood when it's far less bad than coal for a pine 2 by 10. Pine have to be more bent because it's hidden. Whereas redwood, they assume it's visible. I hide it, and uh, so, uh, but they, they know me, and they look, they, they spend the time, and they go over everything to make sure I meet all my, I over-engineered, I was a Bell system, you know, Bell lab scientist. We over-engineered everything, because it had to last 40 years. We really killed it on, on over-engineering, so I do that. And so they see that I'm over-engineering everything. I uh, remember reading that the, uh Public service company has problems with trees growing up underneath power lines, and one of the things they have done is they've added a, some kind of a, uh, not exactly a defoliant, but just something that slows the growth of trees. You know, I, I every now and then the dark side of my mind tries to figure out what I should do to slow the shading that's overcoming some of my solar gain, but that's the dark side, and we're at a church, and I won't dwell on. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we have this huge deck that's perfectly oriented on the back of our house, faces southwest. Perfect. Or something. It's time to get rid of redo the deck. To replace the deck is probably a ten thousand dollar This deck. right here, which is two stories high, yeah. is where the deck was. The rotten old deck. 
<laughs> and the downstairs, the lower of those two levels, where the walkout basement comes up, yeah. is a nice workshop and a smaller workshop. And the upstairs is the conference room, the passage solar clothes dryer, and an airlock coming out to the lower deck, which is down six steps. So yes, that was a deck. How do I find a reputable architect, contractor? No, no, I, I, I don't know. I'm the architect. I know. I, I, I do my own. Get a piece of graph paper, get a straight edge and a pencil, and measure and draw, and you will find that you're an architect. <laughs> you will find them. <laughs> Make mistakes, make glorious mistakes. You won't make a mistake. But trust far enough to let yourself try. And then, when you get to a point you think might work, go to an architect if you want. That's a good idea. But you will have really put in everything you care about. Okay. Or a structural engineer, if it's something you can't achieve. Yeah. But I need somebody who can who understands no, no. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not going to do references on oh, that because okay. I have no idea because I haven't used any. Okay. That's not what I'm doing. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to be the guy that's doing it because on my $20,000 annual pension, I cannot be <laughs> buying those services. Yeah. And, and as far as the city considers, it's a porch uh, un unconditioned, so it's easier to get it passed. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to have the same ceiling heights in an enclosed porch that you have to have in living space. There's a lot of different states. It has to be strong. can't fall down. The water, the roof has to be waterproof. You know, I mean, there's right. those things. Right. Okay, I'm going to thank you all yes. for coming all this time. <laughs> and I want to thank Jamie for videoing for John for setting up all the electronics up here and just uh, making this all happen.